Hey everybody, it's Mr. N here, and we are going to do this lesson on continuity and IVT. But let's first start with continuity. All right, so continuity, here's what we're talking about. Sometimes, when I take the limit as x approaches a, it can be found by plugging in. We said that's the direct substitution method, and in calculating the value at x equals a. If this happens, and you get a value there, we can call this a continuous function. So now we can say what the definition of continuity is. Now, here's what it's formally defined as. A function f is continuous at a number a if the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals f of a. Wait a minute. So the limit has to be the f of a value. So that's like plugging it in and getting a point there. Which means there's three requirements for this to happen. First of all, f of a is defined, so it's in the domain, and it exists. The limit as x approaches a, or x approaches a of f of x, exists as well. So you have to have an f of a value, the limit has to exist, and the limit has to equal the f of a value. That's the definition of continuity. Those are the three requirements. Again, f of a has to be defined. The limit has to exist, and when you find the limit, it's the same exact value of f of a. So we've talked about those situations where the limits are different, and therefore it wouldn't be continuous. So basically, if you're looking graphically for, on a continuous function, you can trace the whole function without ever having to pick up your pencil. So that's how you could do it graphically. As long as you can trace the whole function, so suppose I had something that looked like this, and I had some function that came up, came down, came back up, whatever. I can take my pencil, or my lightsaber in this case, and trace the whole thing without ever having to pick it up. Then that means it's continuous. Now you can have continuity on an interval, or you can have continuity for the whole graph itself. So let's take a look here. If we have this absolute value, fun uh, I'm sorry, this uh, greatest integer function, and this obviously my software doesn't do it right so it we should look like this okay and I graph this greatest integer function I will get the step function notice how this step function is not continuous because to go from here I have to pick up my lightsaber and then go here so I have to pick up my so it's continuous right here but then I gotta right at this point doesn't equal it and then I gotta pick it up to put it right here again pick it up put it right here so as long as you can, if you cannot trace it without picking up your pencil, then it is not continuous. So over here, if it's not continuous, we say it's discontinuous, so there's a discontinuity, a break in the graph. Now, as for discontinuities, well, that brings on a whole set of types of discontinuities. You can have something that's called a removable discontinuity. On a removable discontinuity, that's like a hole in the graph. So right here, take it out that's a removable discontinuity. You can also have it removable but equaling another value. That's still, I have to pick up my pencil to go to this other value, then put it back down and trace the graph. So over here I have to pick it up to go to the other side and continue tracing. So these are removable discontinuities. Then you've got an infinite discontinuity. Infinite discontinuity would be like, okay, you have an asymptote right here. Both of these on each side have a limit. The limit's infinity, but you don't have an f of zero value in this case and because that is a vertical asymptote, so that's an infinite discontinuity. Then you've got the jump discontinuities, which are like the step functions we've talked about, where you're jumping from here to there. Then you jump up to here. Then you jump up. So this is another situation. You're jumping up to here to continue. So this is a jump discontinuity. And then you've got one that's called an essential discontinuity. It's the same thing as right here as an infinite, but you do have a value for f of c. It is defined. So it's infinite, but then you end up with a value for f of c. All right, let's take a look at what we have over here now. Let's slide this down a little bit. So we can say something is continuous on the whole interval. We could say it's just continuous from the right. We can say it's just continuous from the left. So we can specify where the continuity is, but if it's continuous on a whole interval, then it must be continuous at every number on that interval. All right, so let's take a look at this example. It says graph and show 
that it is continuous on negative 2 to 2. So this, if you didn't recognize it, this is a circle right here. Circle with a radius of 2. So that means if I were to graph it, I'd go 2, 2, and 2, and I'd have this top half of a circle only, though, because it's plus, not plus or minus. So show that it's continuous on negative 2 to 2. And we're only doing it on this domain that they specified. So that means I need to show that the limit as x goes to negative 2 from the right equals f of negative 2. Over here, the limit as it goes to negative 2 from the right is 0. So this limit equals 0. And f of negative 2, when I plug in negative 2 right here, I'll get negative 2 squared is 4, I'll get 0. So it's continuous on that. Notice I only did it from the right because this is the integral. It doesn't care about the other side. So now I could do the other one. There's positive 2. I can say that the limit as x goes to positive 2, this time I want to come in from the left, I have to show that this is equal to f of 2 as well. All right? This limit is 0, because look, you can follow the graph into it. And over here, this answer is 0, so this checks off. So this, since it was the limit equaled f of x, right? You needed f of x to exist, or f of a in our case, f of a to exist. You needed the limit to exist, and then these two must match for continuity. Since we had all three situations, then it worked out, and it was continuous on this interval. Okay, going over a couple of the theorems over here. If you have two functions that are continuous, f and g, at a, and c is some sort of constant, then each of the following conditions uh, are, conti are continuous also. You can add the two continuous functions to get a continuous function. You can subtract two continuous functions to get a continuous function. You can multiply a constant times a continuous function. You'll still end up with a continuous function. You can multiply two continuous functions you get a continuous function, and you can divide them assuming that this denominator is not zero, and you will get a continuous function. So now we have this theorem, that any polynomial is continuous everywhere. So any polynomial you have will always be continuous. Any rational function is continuous wherever it's defined. So obviously Q will give you an undefined spot, but a rational function, remember, is a polynomial over a polynomial, and this will be defined on its domain. So let's do this next one, finding the limit over here. Uh, remember, I always say you can try direct substitution first. This is just an example problem here that we have. And I could just plug this directly in. I'll get 9. This is a 3. So 3 squared is 9 plus 6 plus 1 over the 2 plus 3 times 5 is 15. So I will get 16 over 17. And there's your limit. And worked with direct substitution. So just a quick sample problem there. Over here, the following are continuous at everywhere in their domain. We said polynomials. We said rational functions. Root functions are also continuous everywhere in their domain. And trig functions will be continuous everywhere in their domain. Root function, an example, would be the squared x. And a trig function, an example, would be tangent of x. Continuous in their domain. Be careful. I'm just saying in that domain. All right, let's move on. So now we have, over here, our third example. Determine the intervals of which of the following are continuous. So this first one is a rational function, so I need to determine what the domain is, and it's continuous in that domain. So if I take a look at this graph, we'll do it graphically on this one. You can have also done it by hand and just note that you have asymptotes at x equals plus or minus 3, right? And so we are going to have these asymptotes, and if you graph it with a calculator, that's good as well. But anyway, you will have asymptotes at x equals plus or minus 3 right there and right there. And this graph will look like this in between those. This is one of those that does this funky thing like this. And then on this side, you'll have something that looks like this. And on this side, it'll follow the asymptote up and then go like that. 
All right, so we need to determine where it's continuous. Over here, well, we cannot use, we could say the domain is all reals except x equals plus or minus 3, right? Because we have asymptotes there. So it's continuous from negative infinity to negative 3. And so we're going to do the union symbol, negative 3 to 3, and from 3 to infinity. And notice I did not include these because those are asymptotes. So now let's take a look at this next one. Let's sketch a graph of this real quick so we know what we're looking at. And over here, I have this equation when x is less than or equal to 1, and I have x squared when x is greater than 1. So if something happens at 1, that is my border, so to speak. And over here, it's x squared, so at one, it'll be from right here, and this will go up. And on the other one, it's 2x minus 3. So when you put in 1, you're going to get negative 1. So it's right here, and that's an equal to it. When you put in 0, you'll get negative 3. So this one looks like this, and it's linear. All right, so now we know what we're looking at. So right here, even though we have two polynomials, our point in question is this, at x equals 1. First of all, let's look at the three parts of continuity. First of all, does f of x, in this case it'll be f of 1, f of a, exist? Yes, it does exist. f of 1 will be this value right here at negative 1. Okay. Does the limit as x approach 1 exist? Okay, so when I come in from the left, that's this one. I get negative 1. When I come in from the right, I get positive 1. So this is no, it does not. So that means I don't even have to, I don't even get to step 3. And we even know by just looking at the graph, there's a discontinuity at 1. So the only spots that this is continuous that I can say is from negative infinity to 1, like this, that's this part of the graph, and from 1 to infinity. So I cannot take that discontinuity into play, um, so that's how I have to write this, because there is a discontinuity that occurs right there. All right, so now we have this other theorem. If f is continuous at b and the limit as x approaches a of g of x equals b, then the limit as x approaches a of f of g of x equals f of b. So this is the compositions. So I can actually take the f composition out and do this. So intuitively, as x, gets, as x is close to a, then g of x is going to be close to b, not b, e, b. Also, since f is continuous, at b, if g of x is close to b, then f of g of x is also is close to f of b. Then we have this that develops the root law. And the proof of this law is in your book. I'm not going to go through it, but just know that the limit as x approaches a of the nth root of some function, you can take that outside, take the limit of the function, then take the nth root of it. So that's what this one tells you. And it's... Um, <clears throat> Here is the proof of it, but I'm not going to go over that, and you don't really need to know it in detail. So if g is continuous at a, and f is continuous at g of a, then the composition f of g is continuous at a. So f of g of x, f of g of x will be continuous at a. So what this is saying is compositions, as long as this is continuous, will be continuous as well. I'm going to save these two examples for class. Um, your author likes these a lot, and basically all you're trying to do on these is do compositions to show that, well, this is continuous, so the other thing has to be continuous. And um, same with over here. But I'm going to do these in class. In fact, I'll just do this one right now since it's a little bit easier for you guys. This is continuous. Let's do it like this. Right? That's a polynomial. This is a trig function. It's continuous. So if I have continuous minus continuous, one of the laws told me that it will be continuous. So, and it'll be continuous on all real values because this is continuous on all real values and that's continuous on all real values as well. All right, let's move on. Take a look at the next thing, which is IVT. 
At this point in the lesson, I would recommend that you pause, go take a break, just hang out a little bit because catch your wind because this is another biggie, so I need your full attention for this one. All right, so the Intermediate Value Theorem, commonly abbreviated as IVT, super important, typically does show up on an AP test. And let's just read what the definition is first, and I'll explain all this to you. Suppose F is continuous on a closed interval, A to B, so it's a closed interval from A to B. And let N be any number between F of A and F of B, where F of A doesn't equal F of B. So we have this some number on a closed interval, A corresponding to F of A, and B and F of B that correspond. Then there exists a number C in AB such that F of C equals N. All right. So the intermediate value theorem is really saying that a continuous function, no matter how you draw this, will take on all the values between f of a and f of b. So if it's continuous, there's going to be values all in between here. So this above this graph shown illustrates the IBT. Since it is continuous, you will have one value between f of a and f of b. So here's a, here's what IBT says. Think intermediate. Here's a, there's b. If you have something in between, so this would be f of a, this would be f of b, and you put something in between a and b, well then, this has to be between, this n value has to be between f of a and f of b. It's pretty, like, logical thinking. Now, here's another example I can give you. Suppose this is your house right here, and here's school. And here's your friend's house. If you're going from your house to your friend's house, no matter how you go, you can go up and around, you can go this way and around, you can go this way then up, you're going to cross the line where school is. Now, I know some of you are saying, well, I'm going to go all the way around the world. Okay, you go ahead and do that. But to demonstrate IVT, to get from point A to point B, from your house to your friend's house, you're going to have to cross this line where school's at. And once you do that, that means you'll have some value f of a here, some value f of a b there. And once you cross that line, you will have some value here that we will call n on the y-axis. Now, it's important to note that the intermediate value theorem, it only says the function will take on some n somewhere. It doesn't say what the n will be. It only says that it has to exist. But remember what the conditions are. The conditions are it has to be on the closed interval, and it has to be continuous. So it has to be continuous from here to here. You can't just jump around. Then you'd have a discontinuity. IVT obviously wouldn't work. And so let's look at this example for that. Um, and again, they will present these in various ways, and we'll show you the ways, and I'll show you all the different ways that um, they would present them on the AP test. But let's look at this one right now. Right here, it says graph this, okay, and suppose we had this situation. I'm going to go ahead and graph it for you right there. And from 0 to 2, you have this equation for, uh, and it's x minus 1. So when I put in 0, I will get negative 1. And let's graph that, so that's down here at negative 1. And then when I put in... 1, I obviously get 0, and at 2, I'll get a value of 1, and this is equal to it here and here, so these will be closed, and it looks like this. Now, the next part of the graph is x squared, whenever x is between 2 and 3, so here's 2, 3, and this is x squared, so when I put in 3, I come all the way up here to 9, we'll just kind of exaggerate that, because it's not perfect right there, and when I put in... 2, I'm going to get a value of 4, and I'll 1, 2, 3, 4, and this is a break in the graph because it's not a perfect graph here. I didn't have enough room to draw it. So that's an open circle, and it looks parabolic in nature like that. All right, so does IVT work here? No, there's a discontinuity. I can't follow from here to there without 
when I get here, I got to jump up. There's a jump discontinuity there, so IVT wouldn't hold. So therefore, there is no val values in between for C such that f of C equals n. Here's how we used to use intermediate value theorem in a long time ago. Your calculator's doing a little different now. But IVT, you can use IVT to approximate roots. If you plug two numbers in and notice a sign change between positive and negative, then the theorem says that there must be a root as long as it's continuous. So wait, let's see what that means again. So suppose you had your axes here. And I could draw the y-axis, it doesn't really matter, because right now I'm only concerned with the sign change. And I draw this, I have some sort of continuous function, and it has negative values here, then it values change to positive, and it's continuous. Well, if the values are negative there, and the values are positive here, what is in between a negative and a positive? A zero. So, long time ago, and sometimes you will notice it on your calculator, it's just kind of very similar, where it asks for the left bound or uh, lower bound, upper bound, when you're trying to solve for those zeros. Um, that's kind of the same situation here. So that's one way that IVT is applicable. You'll see other ways. Again, I will show you in class with some of these examples of how they will appear on the AP test. So that's IVT. So now I'm going to do some select examples, and then the ones I don't do here, we could do in class. But let's do a few here. Uh, we'll do this first one for continuity. State the intervals on which this function is continuous. Well, looking at this, we can see that it's continuous right here. From negative infinity to 4, that asymptote. Then, from negative 4 to 4. And then from 4 to infinity. Looking at the next one. Over here, we've got the continuity going from 1, and it's equal to it there, to 2, not equal, and then from 2 to 3. All right. Page. We'll do some of these examples as well. Let's see which ones uh, we will do, and then I will save some for class as well. Um, let's do uh, number two to find where it's discontinuous and then determine what kind of discontinuity. So for A, if I were to sketch a graph of this, it would look like at negative two here there's going to be an asymptote. And this side will go up, that side will go up, and I knew that it was at negative two because I looked at the graph. This is an infinite discontinuity at x equals 2. Okay, looking at the next one. Can you see where uh, what it's going to be? It's going to be an absolute value function. Right? So if I were to sketch a quick graph of that, and I'm doing the graph so that you can see it, um, right here, it's shifted to the right, and it looks like this. Right? Absolute value graph. It's continuous everywhere. I can trace this whole thing with the lightsaber or your pencil, and you'll never have to pick it up. So this has none. And it's continuous on all real values. All right. Look at the next one. This might be a little tough. So if you don't see it, well, I mean, you look at the denominator, you know it's going to have to be at zero. And this is the absolute value of x over x. So if I were to quickly sketch a graph, you know at zero something happens. So you know there's going to be some sort of discontinuity there. You could already tell. You can't have a zero. If I use negative numbers, I'll have negative 1, and it looks like that. If I use positive numbers, I'll have 1, and it looks like that. So this is a jump discontinuity at x equals 0. Next, this one is a little bit funky when you graph it, and I'm going to spare you the details. And if you plug in points, you know something's going to happen at 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. We'll just get to the good part. If I plug in 4 into the top equation when it's less than 4, 
I'll get a value of 11. So up here at 11. And this is linear, so uh, yes, obviously the graph is not to scale. So this will look something like this on this side. It's equal to it. And it goes, it'll go through the point. Um, it's actually maybe two thirds, so it's kind of a weird point, but it goes like this. On this side, this will be, have this same value of 11, it'll be an open circle, and it'll go this way, like that. But it's continuous here, because it's equal to it on one of them. So I can trace and not pick up my pencil. And so this is continuous on all reals. So we say none. But now for the next one. Okay, let's take a look here. If I quickly sketch a graph, we know what the point we're looking at in question. Right here, we were concerned about this 2 value. So let's see what happens. If I were to sketch this graph, you would have at 2. When I plug it in here, you're going to get 1 plus 1, which is 2. And um, when you put in 0, you're obviously going to get 1. So this looks like this when it's to the left. And it's equal to, that's why I closed it. For the other one, when I put in uh, 2, I'm going to get a value of 1, and that'll be an open circle. And then when I put in a value of 3, I'll get 0, and that will look like this. So this ends up being a jump discontinuity. So this is a jump discontinuity. You can also call it a non-removable. And this is at x equals 2. Let's do one more. Let's skip over and see if we could do an IVT problem right here. Let's do this one, and then we'll save the rest for class. So on this one, it says, show that the intermediate value theorem guarantees that, four, that x cubed minus 4x squared plus x plus 3 equals 0 has a root between 1 and 2. Use your calculator to approximate these roots. Okay, so they're telling us that we want to show that it has a root somewhere between this value, 1, and and this value too. All right, so let's see how we can do this. Let's plug in one. It even says, use your calculator. So I'm gonna plug in f of one. f of one comes out to be one cubed, which is one, minus four times one, which is four, negative four, uh, plus the one, plus the three. Plus the one, plus the three. Let's put that one in. And this comes out to be 1, but I'm more concerned with it's a positive number. Positive. Okay, let's try f of 2. f of 2 is going to give me 8 minus 16 plus 2 plus 3. And this comes out to negative 3, which is a negative number. If I go from negative to positive, so in this case it's positive to negative, Therefore, a sign change on a continuous function, thus, by IVT, there will be a root. There will be a zero somewhere on there because we showed the sign change. All right? So the ch sign change right here guarantees that there's going to be a zero somewhere, and that's a root. All right, so let's just do one more. I really want to do this one because this is, a, this is good uh, for the video, and uh, I'm sure many people um, outside of my class have questions on things like this. So this is something you will see on an AP test. You're going to be given all this information. Which of the following represents one of these graphs? So let's see if we could do it where we just have to graph it ourselves. So sketch a graph of the function, and I'm going to put an axis here. And here's the information I'm given, that it's continuous from negative infinity to 2, and then from 2 to infinity. So I know something right away, based on this info, happens at 2. And I'm just going to put this, doesn't that necessarily have to be an asymptote, but I'm just going to put that just so that... It helps me to remember something's happening at 2 with the continuity. All right, so then I take a look at the next thing. 
and it says the limit as x goes to 0, here's my 0 right here, um, is 4. So that means from the left and from the right, there is a value right here at 4, since that's the limit. Okay, then the limit as I go to 2, here's 2, from the left-hand side, so that means I'm looking at it from here, this limit is going to be negative 3. Okay, so just from the left, it's negative 3. So that's 1, 2, negative 3, right here. There is a value there, because from the left-hand side, I'm reaching that negative 3, and I know that there is a value there because it's closed right here. If that wasn't closed, I wouldn't have a value there. So it's continuous from here to here, so that means there is a value there at, at uh, 2 from the left, and that value is going to be negative 3. That's where it's approaching. Okay, then 2 from the right is infinite, so that means it's up here. Infinite means it's up there, 2 from the right. And then the limit as x goes to 5 is 0. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it comes all the way down here in 0, and it's continuous, so it's got to cut through this. So this has got to cut through here. This has got to cut through here because obviously it's continuous. So now any way you sketch this could be different because we don't know what happens in between. I'm going to kind of keep it simple, and I'm just going to say this comes down here, and it's going to continue on this way. This will go like this and it'll just continue on that way. Again, answers can vary on that, but I'm just trying to keep it as simple as possible. All right, we will stop with that example. Uh, we've got many more. We'll uh, take care of them in class. So uh, thanks for watching the video. Hit that like and subscribe button, and I'll see you guys in the next video.